Theatre in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, when Balanchine was the director um, of that company. She then returned to the US and joined another giant of 20th century dance, uh, Merce Cunningham, and performed leading roles for the Merce Cunningham company. In the 1980s, she formed her own company, Armitage Gone Dance, and she has shaped the evolution of contemporary dance and choreography ever since. Um, the list of her collaborators is staggering from visual artists such as Jeff Koons, Karen Kilimnik, David Sally, Christian Markley, um, to Madonna, Michael Jackson, Merchant Ivory, and Marc Jacobs. She's also choreographed the Broadway musical Hair. Um, she was honored with, a, with an honorary doctorate of arts from Kansas University, a Radcliffe Fellowship at Harvard University to study Native American plain sculpture, and she is an MIT Media Lab Director's Fellow. Uh, we're truly delighted to have them with us tonight to discuss this new biography of one of the most important choreographer of 20th century of the 20th century. It's written with a historian's pre precision and perspective, a dancer's ex expertise, and a writer's sense of pace and narrative. Mr. B is, to quote the New York Times, a serious act of cultural retrieval by a writer who knows when to expand and when to collapse, who makes unexpected connections, and who knows when her subject pinches, borrows, or steal steals. The critic, historian, and dancer in Homans are nearly always in sync. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Homans and Carol Armitage. Before I hand it over to Jennifer and Carol, a few words about tonight's event. The event is being live streamed and it will be archived on PCG Studio, um, which is a, a page on our gallery's webpage, website. Um, you'll be able to view it there and to share it with others. Um, our speakers will have a 40 to 45 minute conversation after which we'll have a short Q&A. And once the Q&A is over, you're welcome to get your copy of the book signed by Jennifer. Over to you. I think Hi. We both want to <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really honored to be here to speak about this book. I, indeed, it is a wonderful biography. You know, I've read all the memoirs of, of the ballerinas, all the think pieces about Balanchine, all the books about Balanchine. So it's a subject I know really well. Uh, and I, of course, danced in the Geneva Ballet, went to SAB. In fact, Diana Adams, one of the prima ballerinas gave me my audition for SAB in a closet because I arrived at 13 from Kansas with no idea of, you know, maybe you should organize this ahead of time to be taken into a school. But, you know, I thought it was pretty hilarious because it was very dark in there. She couldn't really see what I was doing. <laughs> That's about coming. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and, and worked with Balanchine in a very superficial way, but, you know, he did rehearse the company, uh, worked with the orchestra, the costumes, did all the rehearsals on stage, and then taught class for us for quite a time at one, at one point. And then, <laughs> most characteristically, we would go out occasionally to a restaurant called La Cave Valaisanne. It was all of the 25, 17 to 22 year olds, more or less, women. Balanchine would be there and we would all eat fondue together. <laughs> so th I, I, I know this material well, um, but this is a book that is so much more than just a great biography. It has, you know, I think three incredible pillars that are really important in making dance powerful in the world. And one of them is this art historical perspective, which, you know, allows one to see the, the historical context in which these ideas, the politics, the social, political, um, cultural, sexual ideas, all of these things that are swirling around that are forming a person and in, in influencing their imagination. So we get a really wonderful segments of this. The second pillar to me is talking about how dance makes meaning. I mean, people are, a lot of people are intimidated. We don't really have a lot of language for describe, for really getting inside the experience of dance and how it communicates. And you've done, you know, these beautiful uh, sections of, of making that come alive. And then the third one, which we'll get to gradually is the revealing of the family secrets. 
we'll, we'll leave that for later. Um, Am I leaving anything out that you feel are like the important facets? No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm with you the whole way. Well, and, and one other thing, just a kind of quick aside is, you know, everyone says that, you know, once you've danced, nothing else, you know, engages you to such a great extent. You know, I, I've known dancers to become doctors and lawyers and writers and many other things. But, you know, as a dancer, you were just using so much of your whole self because it's, you know, it's physical, it's mentally challenging, it uses memory, it uses emotion, it's observation, uh, it's erotic. I mean, you're just calling upon all of these things simultaneously so that everything else kind of pales by comparison. But what about you? How do you sit still and write? And what about this dichotomy between being a dancer at once and now being a writer? Yeah, it's an, an interesting question. And uh, thank you for laying that out so beautifully because those are many of the things I was certainly thinking about. And I'm glad we can talk about them today. Um, you know, being a dancer and being a writer have one thing in common that we were talking about earlier, and it sounds a little strange, but you don't talk. You're, even if you're dealing with words with writing, you're sitting hmm. quietly, and there's hmm. silence around you or whatever music you choose to encompass yourself in. And so there's actually a sort of sense that it feels like the same kind of work process in a way. Yeah, this this kind of meditative, meditative yeah, side exactly. to it. Yeah, hmm. exactly. And the, and the kind of trying to find a way to then for me you know as you were saying the the description of dance was a big part of what i was trying to do in this book and so the act of kind of like trying to transpose myself into the dance at the same time that i'm sitting writing so that i'm actually like feeling what it might feel like mm -hmm. as a dancer whether I'm right or not, I'm, I'm trying to do that and then capture that like almost like quick, you know, because you can't hold on to it for very long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As we know, right? Yes. Well, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with, by this uh, wanting to develop a language to talk about how dance communicates. And I'm obsessed with it for a lot of reasons. Um, the fragility of dance, I think, the fact that there are people who sit in a seat in a theater and they feel the embroidery and the excitement of the movement. They feel a dance dancer penetrating space and they just riff on this exchange of energies and, and, and they love the experience of dance. But I have heard so many times, so many people say, it's a code I don't understand. I can't go see dance. I don't know what's going on. So I feel like so that we need to really develop this. Again, I am using the word of art history, but a real intellectual way of understanding how the history, not only the history, but what dance itself is, what the, what the components are that work and how they work. And I think a lot of it is you, you, you create pattern and variations of pattern and eruptions of pattern, and these create frictions. And just the unfolding of patterns somehow gets to us, it may be in our biology on a very deep level, and we feel and enjoy this process. But then there can be just like a turn of the dial. And even with, you know, dancers who are a purely visual element with these contrapuntal kaleidoscopic actions, turn of the dial and suddenly oh, it feels so different. What is going on now? It is making me think and question my way of perceiving this, of having a dialogue with this, how I am in the world. Um, and, and, and I also think it's important because I do feel that dance is so fragile. I mean, we are in a world of on-demand culture, celebrity culture, loudness. I mean, there's so many things but dance, you know, it's very expensive. Um, there are no real celebrities. You know, there is no money. There is very little glamour. I mean, so in order to appreciate it and to have it 
feel meaningful. I, I just think we need to be able to speak about it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And this was actually something that it, that took, um, you know, I mean, you're very cerebral in your work as well. And you have obviously a, a sort of significant analytic process going on that's both visual and musical and physical and maybe more things as well. But, you know, Balanchine certainly had that. And I, I, I struggled for a while in my own desire to write about dance because it seemed to me that this was an art form that I had been taught from day one is not about words. And in fact, words will destroy it. And words will actually, I even remember when I was dancing once, I was standing in the wing and, and um, a colleague at PNB said to me, um, if you have words in your head, you, you'll, you won't be able to do it. You have to get rid of those words. Because if you have the words running in your head, they're going to destroy whatever that sort of flow is that you get when you are actually giving yourself, giving into the body. So, so for me to write about dance, I was at first just like, no, two different things. Two different things I'm not doing. It. And so then, you know, Paula's Angels, I tried it. And then I've been writing criticism for a while, as, as, as most of you probably know. And then this was even a greater challenge because the idea of kind of trying to settle into a whole ballet or make it interesting to people who weren't actually seeing it and who might never see it. I mean, mm. most people in this room have probably seen a lot of Balanchine's work, but there are lots of people, of course, all over the world and all over America that haven't mm -hmm. seen a single ballet. And mm -hmm. so I was trying to it, basically translate. I mean, it seemed to me an act of translation to put these dances into words and make them part of a story without reducing them, without reducing the work to the life or the life to the work, which is always, you know, was like, like a, yeah, like it was like a minefield, that that thing. No, you you walked the tightrope brilliantly on so many levels. I mean, no, no <laughs> doubt, you. no doubt. You know, I, I think the other thing is, uh, we're talking about balance, but I think this whole thing about how dance makes meaning, you know, applies pretty much across the board to all kinds of theatrical dance. I mean, you know, there is something about dance that is really about the intimacy of experience and this, you know, it is in that realm, you know, it's not in the, the, the noisy world. It's a, it's, it is a more internal mental world where it operates. I don't think Balanchine brought that to us. I don't know how you feel about it. Oh, well, see, I think that's partly true. Thing. Not totally. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. Like, well, you know, I mean, just look at classical ballet. I mean, Take Swan Lake. I mean, people are not loving Swan Lake because of the story. They are loving the deployment of this exciting, thrilling embroidery of dance steps mixed with this almost hypnotic altered consciousness that you get with the swans moving through space. I mean, so I, I think this whole internal world, again, it applies to classical ballet. If you look at Alvin Ailey, um, you know, it is through the movement itself. It again is through actual dance that the meaning is created. And you is see it with Alvin Ailey, wanted, you right? see it in yeah. Ronald K. Brown with his Afro uh, Caribbean meditative deployments in space. I mean, it's just, I think, really good dance makes its meaning through dance and has these other kind of metaphoric experiences that are offered by the audience member, the observer interacting using their imagination and curiosity to engage with what's happening. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I absolutely, on all accounts, I think one of the things that Balanchine did that was different and unusual to me was that he really flattened the surface of stage. And he, in a way, I mean, this is, I go into this in, in, the, in the book and I'm not, you know, Inventing this is something that Lincoln Kirstein was also interested in, is this idea of the icon and the way that you actually see things. So that if you, if you, and of course in painting as well, the surface is being flattened around this sort of, in this sort of post-war period, right? And so a ballet like Agon, for example, you know, where you've taken away sets, you've taken away 
what we would think of as costume, although a leotard and tights is obviously a costume as well, you've bathed the whole stage in strong light. And music and steps, Stravinsky, part atonal score, and dancers doing steps with no apparent narrative form. So it's exactly what you're talking about, but I think one of the things that he was able to do is that by this, this kind of flattening and taking away the, the, the furniture of perspective that is the traditional way of looking in Western art, he really kind of like flipped it and reversed it so that instead of you looking at something and going into it, it's more the thing is coming and getting you and pulling you in. And that's where the intimacy seemed to me to come in, where, you know, he wasn't really looking for a performance, a, a sort of, you know, in the traditional uh, Russian 19th century ballet way, right? Yes, I mean, there are lots God. of ways in which that's... that was disrupted in the 20th century before him, especially in the ballet russe, but he really develops that idea that, you know, easy and we're, we're gonna go in, we're gonna bring people in, we're not gonna go out and we're, we're gonna go in, we're gonna bring people in, we're not gonna go out to them, we're gonna bring in by no expression, no smile, just the body, like the body is the face, the body is the thing doing the expressing. And so that's a real, that seemed to me to be a real, that's kind of fantastic as a way of, of looking at things. And, and he was, one of the things that surprised me in writing the book was how intellectually he engaged he was. You know, we were always told as, as students as, and dancers of Balanchine, you know, don't think, just dance, these kinds of aphorisms that, that are probably not really true, but they were certainly said and there was an element of that. The same thing about the words, no words. Well, you know, he was reading a lot of words, I found out, and was really deeply uh, interested in ideas of theology and mysticism and in science and in um, literature. literature. He read widely, especially in, you know, Goethe, the Bible, Spinoza, Quixote, Cervantes, it's just over and over you start to find out that this man is deeply involved in, in words and thinking and the ideas that are, are coming into the, to the dance and very interested in art. And so he, and he knows quite a lot about art because he's like passed from St. Petersburg into the revolutionary uh, avant-garde and into Weimar, Germany, uh, not the place, the the culture of Weimar into Paris in the 20s, into New York in the post-war period. Um, and so he's just taking in so much and he's looking, he's not just focused on his little project, he's looking and absorbing everything. Yeah, and, and the dance world, you know, as you said, those early days with someone like Malevich making the black, what is that, black the, black, the black square in, in yeah. 1915, and how, you know, that getting away from the figure and, and, and the non-materiality, I mean, this, you know, it, and I think you said really beautifully, um, dance and art seem to come together really with a similar project when there's a will to abstraction and it's an art of retreat taking place away from the chaos of the outside world, a connection when, you know, there's a will to purify. And of course, Balanchine, I mean, getting rid of the story, the theatricality, the fancy costumes, most of the stage business, I mean, was, you know, very much connected, I think, to this idea of, of, of purity and, and the other things that you said and then it's sort of yes after world war ii of course there's the the uh, the merce cunningham john cage rauschenberg jasper johns robert rauschenberg jasper johns um which was again you know out of the chaos let's just look at the thing let's 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 develop the project of awareness not telling anyone what to think or feel but to create a kind of awareness and when the dance the music and the design were 
not coordinated together. It was about, you know, you as the observer making your choices and experiencing moment and time uh, as with, with a kind of self-awareness. And then the next time it became really close, I think was again, this will to purity is minimalism where there was a lot of, um, I mean, there's, well, there was a lot I think about in, in the art side about perception, you know, how the mind really, how it sees just literally seeing itself exposition color and the, and this kind of, um, what is developed in how the brain sees and things about perception. And there's some beautiful dance in its extreme purity, but I was always worried that there was also a very puritanical sort of realistic potential in this, you know, in our Puritan heritage that this minimalism in dance, which uses the body after all, you know, was calling upon. Yeah, and if I may ask you a question, because I have one. Um, (laughs) You know, you you worked with Cunningham, you worked in Balanchine's presence, as you were describing. I mean, and I've thought a lot about this while I was writing the book, um, in part because some of the people in this in this audience would would question me, you know, what's how come Balanchine wasn't in that sort of contemporary modern art world of New York? How come he sort of stayed with his people? And I mean, and what's the difference between, how do you see, and even as a dancer, how did it feel to you, the difference in working in the sort of Cunningham way and in the Balanchine way, as it were? Well, this is another kind of family secrets coming out. All right, I will, I will honestly answer that. <laughs> Um, there is in, in the dancing, in just the pure physical experience of dancing, a balancing dance. I mean, and I, my first teacher was, you know, when I was six years old, had been in New York City ballet and I learned, you know, serenade, gunos, all of, all of these balancing ballets at a very young age. So I felt it from a very young age. There was an inevitable, powerful yeah, moving that way is amazing. You, right? you, you, you know there is a rightness. It is like the sun rising and setting. It is just so profound. Now, Cunningham, one of the reasons that I the same depth of um knowledge of the technology of the body that is good for the body. Now, this will be very controversial because everyone thinks ballet is supposed to destroy the body. No, I, I really disagree. It really is an under a profound understanding of the technology of the body, how the muscles, limbs, ligaments work. Cunningham is more dangerous to the body. I went back to ballet because I wanted to realign and regain my, uh, yes, just ability to articulate as much as possible. So they felt different in that way. But the other interesting thing is, when I went to the Paris Opera and did a piece, there was one piece, it was uh, Stockhausen. And so, of course, there's no music to listen to and count. And all those Paris, and this is very early in the, you know, this is in the early 80s, before Paris Opera had much contemporary dance. I mean, there, Carolyn well, Carson had, so had been there M. and they'd had no Cunningham. And I, I was one of the first. And I had to, you know, make dance movement with these purely... Paris opera trained ballet dancers and they could move brilliantly without music because the, the, the physical rhythms of the body are again, something that Cunningham really understood that is, that are, that is also an irrefutable profound reality. Yeah, no, I mean, I came to see them more as, you know, because at the time and even at the time we were dancing, you know, there was this feeling that there was this, this uptown world and there was this downtown world and that these were two things that were separated and Balanchine was part of the uptown world. In fact, he was probably the leader of the uptown world and, <laughs> and Cunningham was the downtown world and maybe the leader or one of the leaders of the downtown world. And, and, and as you look back with, 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 you know, years and years and decades, it seemed to me that they were in fact part of the same project. I mean, different facets, of course, as you're saying, right? But there is oh. a kind of oh, I agree. And interest in linearity, yeah. interest in how and why the the stage is the stage, what the centering and decentering, and this is something that often people think that Balanchine wasn't interested in these things, but he was actually, you know, his whole project was to decenter the body. 
which, as you say, you have to have, you can't decenter unless you know what the center is. So, I, I mean, I think the one difference um, is Balanchine, Sheen, of course, is very aware of directing the eye in a way that had, you know, incredible clarity, but it did have more of a hierarchy of, of where to look and how to focus, whereas Cunningham really did create a field of experience and visual counterpoints of things not coordinated, but happening simultaneously. So therefore you made the choice of where to look. And, 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 and that is, you know, the main radical difference, I think, between them. Yeah, no, that makes total sense to me. I think that's right. But they I both mean, believed in dance itself, they both the making of exactly. steps, the architecture of time, that that profound experience of seeing time in action formed and disappearing is a marvel and they did it to the hilt. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they were both interested also in creating a spontaneous experience on stage. So that, you know, I mean, for all of the, the so-called perfection of ballet and the, the organization of the body that has a very particular and idealized form, Perfection, perfection is because perfection is going to destroy any. Wait a minute, how are we going to, you know, perfection is the enemy. Perfection, perfection is, is the, the enemy devil. Because perfection is going to destroy any sense of life. And he wants, above all, life. Like the, not even like just life, like us sitting here, like heightened life, more life, bigger life, greater life, an energy, right? What are you waiting for? You might be dead tomorrow. And that was his life, really. He he almost died many times. And he, he really had a very, this is the other thing that I was just struck with as I wrote the book. You know, his life was difficult and he suffered a lot. And he, he poured everything into this idea that he was going to create a life that was almost death-defying for those moments. Not in, you know, not forever, of course, but in those moments on the stage. So how do you make somebody be spontaneous when they're doing highly organized movement? That was the problem. And he would do crazy things like, um, you know, one of my favorite early stories is he, he makes a dance and he, you know, he never wanted to over rehearse things for this reason. And so the dancers said, well, wait a minute, we don't know the end of the dance. We don't know how it, how it ends. And he said, don't worry, you're going to, you're gonna know how it ends. You'll 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 know when it's over. You'll know. And so they were like, right, you know. So that that night, you know, this was some opera. I can't remember which one. And that night, you know, they're all doing their thing. They get to a certain point. They don't know what's next. And he charges on stage on horseback <laughs> and goes straight into them. And they scatter. And he says, "See, you knew what to do." <laughs> you know. So there's a way in which you know he was constantly trying to create these circumstances. And he would say to them, you know, nobody will know but me. If you get it wrong, nobody will know but me. If you don't know the steps, take a different route. Just be in, do something interesting. Do something that's really in the present moment, like now. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think the whole idea of don't think, just dance is in order to not become in some way psychological and calculating, but to be wild and free and daring and exactly. in a realm of danger because you're almost falling over. I mean, that's what he loved. And he loved extreme individuality, you know, the opposite of what he loved. And he loved extreme individuality, you know, the opposite of you know what many people think ballet is, which is you know a co cookie cutter that you all should look and feel and move the same way. No, it was completely the opposite about each person finding their own way of feeling their being and unleashing it. Right, right. and not sort of like you know I'm expressing myself. It wasn't no, no. that. It no. was, it was you know in this very um, in this work that was defining limits, both musical and visual and physical. And within those limits, what can you do? How is it gonna how is it gonna go? How is it gonna look? So that each night is a is a kind of, you know, a, an experiment or an explosion, which people at the time, you know, we all knew that 
it mattered a lot, number one, who danced. <laughs> and, and number two, it mattered a lot what happened that night, because it wasn't going to be the same as what it was two nights before, even if it's the same people. It's just not going to be the same. Yeah. Like now Suzanne Farrell saying, you know, I dance options, not oh, yes. steps. That, right? That's I a dance beautiful, options, beautiful right? phrase. Fantastic. Well, we're speaking of Suzanne Farrell. I think it's time now <laughs> to maybe get to the the uh, the revealing the family family secrets part of this <laughs> <That's> story. <good. laughs> um, I will say, you know, that I definitely drank the Kool Aid of the Balanchine um, mission, which is a mixture of, you know, the the power of the work and just feeling like this is something that. I'm willing to dedicate myself to because it, it, it's it's just so meaningful. It's so deep. It's it's so exciting. It's glamorous. I mean, it just it it was. I would you know. And and when you're dancing, you know, you're in pain a lot. You 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 do it. You know, there is no money. There is no glory, but you do it because you are trying to achieve this kind of incredible ideal of being aliveness and form that is impossible to achieve. But there is something about that that is just so in dance that is so compelling. And so you 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 have this feeling of you you need a kind of it's easy to want a leader that gives you the feeling that this mission is going to be meaningful. And therefore, you know, there's this kind of idea that dance is often a, a cult because you are submitting so much to the form of dance and that particular person's vision of, of dance. So I, you know, I bought completely into that and I bought into this, uh, one of these other wonderful phrases, dance is woman. Now I can see that for men and probably gay men in particular, this is not something that is, you know, that really was inviting, but for a young woman in the Midwest, this felt like real liberation, real potential to not be, you know, a, a teacher or a nurse or a housewife, but it was a different way of being able to have an, an independent, fulfilling life. So, yeah, it, it you know, and it was a world where women really empowered women in all, in general were better dancers. They, uh, their bodies, of course, are more flexible, and in some ways, as you describe, you know, it is quite natural for women and to excel in this medium. And then there's, um, you know, the fact that of course men ran the school, men ran the companies, men did the choreography, men probably had the power, but that didn't somehow matter because your own individual life was being empowered. And we weren't thinking, I think, about that other kind of power at the time. So we get to, the fact that I, you know, for me, it was very, it was liberating, not confining. And maybe you want to describe some of this um, behind the scenes that you so, well, I'll say one more thing and then let you, let you speak. I mean, we all knew the kind of sexual pressures on the ballerinas and his way of truly falling deeply in love and having amazing, uh, his imagination being so stimulated by by different individual dancers, women, and wanting a sexual relationship to be part of that. And But no one really wanted to spill the beans, I think, because dance is fragile and, you know, it takes a lot of money. And, it, you know, people were very careful, I think, to not say too much in a place that might condemn these things. But here we are in the era of, you know, identity politics and thinking about gender and the Me Too movement. And you could not, not address all of these things that were such a part of the life of this company in ways that are really complex. And you did it, I, I think, in, incredibly well because you really, with all the specificity, anyways, have you speak? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a, uh, I, yeah, we, we had the same experience. I mean, I also was asking myself as I was working on this, you know, wow, was I part of a cult? You know, <laughs> I mean, is that what that was? <laughs> it didn't feel like it to me at the time, but maybe it was. And so these questions are sort of swirling around and you, and then, you know, but 
what, as you said, right there, you're not in service to a, a, a person or an ego. There was an idea really of service. And I think Balanchine's, the reason people stayed, the reason people put up with this, the reason people, women, decided that they would invest their, their young lives and bodies in this project. And they, you know, I did tons of interviews, over almost 200 or maybe more. And I went back to people many times and I asked them not just about how was Balanchine, what was Balanchine, what, I asked them about their lives. And like you were saying, you know, where you're from, what your ambitions were at the time, what, what, what did they want for their own lives and how did they experience being told as they were, you know, you must weigh before you get paid or you're too fat, dear, or, um, you know, a sort of these kind of very crude comments that he would sometimes make to dancers and not only, not just sometimes. So there were, um, you know, it's not an environment that, that is, is necessarily good for a young woman who's just, you know, we're talking 17, 18, 19, um, the body is just forming or your all the things that are happening in a, a young body like that. It, uh, though there was a kind of chorus, and this is what I tried to represent in the book, is the, the sort of testimony of these women and what their experience of it was. Um, so that meant doing two things. One was saying exactly what happened and doing that in a kind of, in a way, in cold blood, you know, just like almost forensically, like this is what happened. This is what was what I was told, this is what I have from archival sources, this is what we know, or what I have come to know about what happened. And so just laying it out, number one, and then going back and saying, well, what? It, how did they experience it? And so much of what they said is what you just said, and certainly what I felt too. And I tried to represent the difficulties and not shy away from any of the very you know, some of it's a bit ugly, for sure. And he was no saint, and he could be very cruel. So, um, and very generous. I mean, it's it's sort of a, a deeply complicated person. And, and then there's this, what I came to understand, too, is the relationship between him and a dancer. And I think you're alluding to this as well. I mean, um, is so personal. It's about their bodies. Their bodies are being kind of sculpted by themselves and by him. And they're doing it together. But he can't do it without them because they have to do it. And after all, when the curtain goes up, they're free on the stage. So they have quite a lot of freedom. But in the process of doing it, there's a, a, a mutual dependence that develops because he literally can't make dances without them. So they have a lot of power over him too. And if they leave, which, you know, he didn't want them to have boyfriends. He didn't want them to have, get married. He didn't want them to have children. He wanted them to become sort of devotees of the dance and to really, he said, I can give you your best self, you know? And the ones who, who, who stayed and got that say, he did give me my best self. He knew me better than anyone else. And so they, they, even if it was hard in other ways, they say it was, as you said, the, one of the greatest moments of my life, right? I was in the presence of something so powerful that I would never have given that up. And I think the, the power relationship, if you will, and it wasn't really about power. It was about beauty and about art and about service to this thing that was greater than them. And so, you know, they were there for that. He was there for that. They Neither one could do it without the other. They needed him because he had a, some kind of vision or genius or he could make these dances that made them feel like they were, you know, as he would have put it, you know, in the fourth dimension or in a kind of higher state, in some kind of transcendent state, even if it's not every night and your feet hurt and all the rest, right? But so I think there's a way in which this, the, the family secret 
had to do in a way with, with safeguarding what they had there, even if it meant, even, so, you know, like one dancer said to me, it's like this. Either you're, either you're in or you're out. And if you're in, you're in, and you don't talk about it. That's why they're family secrets, right? You don't share laundry and or what, what is the phrase? You don't wash your, wash your dirty laundry in public, right? <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're in and we're part of it. Now that sounds cultish, right? But they were, they were there for, for the reasons that they had to be there. And it's, it's hard to, you know, I tried to stay out of it basically in writing the book. I tried to present that what happened and present what they told me and then the rest is up to the readers and the contemporary public and what people want to make of it. So that's sort of how I handled the family secrets. Yeah. And I, but I felt I had to get into them in a pretty deep way, you know, and into his sexuality because you had, as, you, you as, had to. I had to. And one, as one of them said, we cared about every inch of him. You know, we were thinking about him all the time. But it's hard to convey also how the atmosphere backstage, this is not like a man who is a, you know, a um, sort of Don Juan figure, or he's not like a womanizer, even though he certainly wasn't always kind to women at all and said things that you could certainly say were misogynistic. And, and yet he loved them and they loved him. And, and these things are possible. They can coexist in human life. I think we all know that. And well, one of, one of the great things about Balanchine, I think, is the expression of the complexity of being human. I mean, he, you know, he did pieces that were, you know, histories and comedies and romances and existential and erotic and uh, about power. I mean, you know, he, he explored a huge, huge range of the psyche. And, you know, this is, I think, erotic and... Uh, about power. I mean, you know, he, he explored a huge, huge range of the psyche and lines. <laughs> yeah. And you're experiencing that. I mean, even if you just think about the stage itself at those moments, right. And, and, you know, we, we were sort of aware of all this, but with him, it's, you know, he used to stand in the first wing every night and he would just, that's where he positioned himself. So he could see everything that was going on and they could see him. So you've got a really interesting situation here where the dancers who've rehearsed and been through a whole process that's outside the stage, and then there's this moment where they cross the line from that world, the ordinary world, into what many of them came to call the realer than real world, the, the real real world, which is this stage world. And on, in this stage world, they are free in the music, but he's also watching and they need him to be watching and he needs them to be dancing. So the whole thing kind of hangs on this, on these very unspoken and complex relationships and dynamics. And then there was the period which I did not know as much about I mean, that I learned from your book, the profound, almost self-destruction and almost destruction of the institution, because his obsession with Suzanne Farrell was so profound that he would leave that first wing when she was no longer dancing and they would go out or he would skip rehearsal and many, many other events that he would normally have participated in, in order to be doing things for, in order to be doing things for and with her. It really got to a point of really truly almost complete destruction. I mean, I am amazed that the, everyone managed to survive this. Uh, and yeah. some and some didn't. Some people left. Some women left because they were just like enough. Well, I know, mean, I enough. mean, even the whole institution. I mean, the fact that it somehow everybody there were well, the belief system was so strong that everyone kept doing it in spite of even his pulling away. Yeah, and there's a way in which you know he operated um, internally. I think 
um, often through loss. And it's, it's a, it's a, you know, I, I thought a lot about, you know, what, what drives this man and what, what is the, ins the so-called inspiration? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a lot of the time, the greatest work comes out of moments of, of, of huge loss. So, you know, he had really difficult moments and Suzanne was one of them because he was a slave to her. And he really, he just, he had an obsession with her that is hard to describe. I mean, he was willing to throw it all over to be with her. And I mean, he's 60 something and she's 20, 21, 22, barely, right? And so there's a, there's a problem in for the company and he's ignoring the other dancers and he's not paying attention to what he's doing except if it's her and she's aware of all of this and and is both flattered and using it and struggling mightily internally because it's an intense pressure on a young woman right so yeah. same time and so it's it's and then when she decides to marry somebody her own age uh, in the company who was also the dancer that Balanchine was grooming as a possible heir. Um, you know, this is a catastrophe for him. This is an absolute catastrophe. And he leaves New York and he goes to Hamburg because he's got some work to do there. And he's just, I mean, he's in uncontrollable crying and just absolutely, you can't soothe this man. He's in a state of crisis. He's depressed. He's taking drugs to to help his psyche. He's he's really at the at the bottom. And there's even a picture in here that I found that Irving Penn did that was just uh, at this time. And his face is fallen. It's like a it's like cratered and fallen. It's he was he was undone. And then you know a year later Stravinsky dies. And so then this other, you know, huge pillar in his life is gone. And then what happens? The Stravinsky Festival, one of the gre greatest choreographic and creative moments of his entire life. And out of all this comes that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. It's astounding because the, the I, I, you know, the mixture of kind of the machinery of dance in something like Symphony in Three Movements, which is just so kaleidoscopically, contrapuntally, physically be um, amazing. I mean, just like wildly inventive and complex syncopations and, and ideas about movement. I mean, it's just like a mind on fire that is, these things are just flowing out. And then you have, you know, Stravinsky Violin Concerto with the unbelievable sensitive intimacy between men and women, as well as the roots in kind of folk dance that have this kind of harm of, of, of being in community. I mean, it's, it's just goes and go. I mean, it's, it's just mind boggling. Yeah, it was a mind boggling <laughs> event. And, and, and uh, those two ballets are the, are of course the great things to emerge from it, even though there were many, many more. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of, I, I was very interested in his inner world and how he functioned in, in his own, you know, you know, to the extent you can never know, it's kind of a crazy project to think that you should be able to get inside the inner world of somebody who's dead. <laughs> Even, well, yeah, to get in the inner world of somebody I, who's alive is, I was is say, hard you enough. Get the, you can't know? even get inside anyone else's real exactly, being, let's face it. <laughs> and there's a way in which the, the uh, you know, I came to sort of see it as the, you know, this realer than real world of the stage and the ways in which fictions, people are fictions and people are the fictions that they make of themselves. And I mean, the figure that 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 kind of pulled all this together was the was the Quixote figure and the, the Cervantes novel. And he made a very serious, not very successful dance about about this novel. And you know, he had read it it's very obvious that he had studied it very closely and he was really, and he himself took the role of Quixote on the opening night. Now, partly that was because he had a gala and he wanted people to you know, come and pay money and all this stuff, but Suzanne was Dulcinea. So there you had it, right? It was, they were living their love affair 
on the stage that night. And everybody else around them knew that. Maybe not the audience, but certainly the other dancers all knew it. So there's a way in which you know the, the life and the fiction start to slide in and out of each other. And this is kind of as, a, as he as he older, the slipping and sliding is even greater. And there's a way in which the, the world of the stage starts to sort of take over. And it's the it's the world that he's really living in. And those dancers are there because they will do that with him. And the ones that submit to that are the ones that are in it with him, whether they're principal dancers or corps de ballet, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, I mean it matters, but it's, you're, you're all there. And he knew everybody in the theater. I mean, the theater was like a kind of organism because he knew all of the stagehands, all of the people who turned on the lights, all the people who did this, did that, did the other thing. He knew them all, he knew them by name. And he, now even in Quixote, there's another example of that great thing of wanting to make that real life on stage. You know, when he did Quixote, there was a big puppet made by Kermit Love of, you know, of, of a knight trying to slash down these windmills and all of that. And, and, and he, as the, as the little Quixote on stage fighting the windmills, he said to the, to the, I can't remember his name now, he would have remembered, but I can't remember, of the stagehand who was supposed to operate the puppet and hit Balanchine. And he said, like, hit me, knock me down, really knock me down. Don't just, you know, pretend, knock me down. He was like, are you sure? Are you sure, really, are you sure? And he did, he did that every night that Balanchine danced around. He really knocked him down. And at the end of the run, <laughs> Balanchine gave him a bottle of his favorite whiskey. <laughs> he knew what the guy's favorite whiskey was. He knew what he liked to drink. He knew all these things about people. And and so he was he was it, it was this whole world in the theater that they were all living in. Should we do questions? Yeah, yeah. questions. Yeah, please. <laughs> Definitely juicy. <laughs> yes. Um, we how much um, is known through his writing, like those amazing you know, diaries or whatever. Mm. I'm wondering if um, you had any writing by Balanchine to refer to. Yeah. Oh, those letters. Those, there, oh. There's a few things that are just, um, and I try to quote them very liberally because his, you know, Balanchine had a way of um, destroying the evidence of his life as he went. I mean, he just didn't care about keeping anything. And except for a few things that were letters from his parents, um, he kept those. There were a few things. And then other people fortunately kept some things. And one of the things that was kept was a series of love letters that he wrote to Vera Zorina in the 30s. And these are, you know, I mean, the passion, the romance, the, the suffering, because she didn't love him the way he loved her. You know? She wanted to, she was one of these dancers. She wanted to dance his dances. She wanted to be his dancer. He wanted her to love him. And he married her and wanted her to be a wife, as he thought of it, <laughs> um, to really love him. And she just didn't. So he, they had a long and difficult relationship and he wrote these letters to her and they're, they're quite extraordinary. I mean, he could barely speak English. He can, the writing is all pigeon, it's pigeon English and it's, and it's remarkable. And the other thing I came across is a series of choreographed notes that were written in his hands that were used um, by somebody who then sort of um, ghost wrote a, a piece about his choreography, which is a, a perfectly good piece, but not terribly, doesn't tell us anything we don't know. But the notes that he had written in his hand were quite extraordinary. And they begin Spinoza, colon. And so this sent me on a whole, you know, I had never read Spinoza. So then I'm reading Spinoza and I'm trying to figure out, I'm talking to experts about Spinoza and trying to figure out what is going on here. And he's not only reading Spinoza, he's reading Goethe at the same time. And he's also, you know, kind of 
here and there, and the things are a little, the thoughts are a little chaotic, and they're also just little pieces of paper here. So I, I worked hard to sort of put these together and to try to understand what he was trying to do. And this was all happening during the Second World War um, when he was in New York and Lincoln had gone to, to Germany to be a monuments man. And, you know, the future was very unknown. It was unclear what was going to happen. That didn't ever worry him very much. But he was trying to understand how the body itself could be thought of as something divine. And so the idea of God is in nature, the Spinozan idea that there's, that there's God in everything and that the, the God is in the body as much as it's in the mind. It's not the mind is somehow a higher thing. The body is equally important. And so this, I think, really was something important for him. So that's a sort of too long answer to the, to the question, but those notes were very exciting to me because it was a part of him I didn't know about. You know, the stories of the great ballets are some title like that, that yeah. you know, and, she, and, and if, you, if you get an old, old version one to have, there, there are kind of prefaces and different sections that he wrote that aren't in the more contemporary Is versions. That right? And Wonderful. They're, they're quite, I think, revealing about him, his, his imagination, how he was, how he was thinking about what the in ways that dance is enchanting and gets under people's skin. Yeah, no, he wasn't afraid to talk that way at all. Other questions? Nancy. Carol, I think you're the only Cunningham dancer who ever danced ballet. I think there are a great many now ballet dancers who think this work. Yeah. So my question. <laughs> Pretty I mean, lucky. It's 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 definitely a big difference. Um, you know, I, I guess I don't feel like it's as big a difference in a way because the motor, the rhythmic motor of, of Cunningham is very intense. And it is this, it functions, I think, very similarly to the way the motor of movement functions with Balanchine because he is not dancing to the music. He's making love to the music. He's count, you know, he is, it's, it's, it's another line to the music. It, it, it you know, it's, it's, it's its own entity and autonomy somehow in relation to the music. And I, you know, therefore, I guess I just, you know, audiences like, I mean, it makes it easier for the audience when there's the music. It's, it appeals to a lot more people, I think. But the, I don't know, the pure dance experience as a dancer is not that different. That is interesting because, and I'm right, I hadn't thought of that actually, that there was a, a sameness to the way. Because I, I agree with you that the, the ways in which, and this is something that musicologists are, are just, have been working on for a while, but are, are really just bringing out in its fullest form, I think, is, is the ways in which Balanchine's, um, you know, it's not dance to music. It's a whole different musical score. It's a physical score that is playing with the musical score. So the, the musical score exists, and then he's moving in and out of it and creating, you know, like, like okay, the musical score, score, the phrase ends here. Well, he's going further. He's taking the dance phrase further past the musical phrase and then doubling or back to catch it or whatever, or, or anticipating yeah. it or referring to a different rhythmic theme or motif and then bringing that back in when the music doesn't have it you know so there's a way in which the dance score is independent even though it would never be done independently because it is hinged on the musical score i mean and and certainly the music gave him a world he want he was going to inhabit through dance Absolutely. so it gave him a you know it gave him a, a subject matter whether that was a subject that was pure dance or or something more metaphorical, um, 
And, you know, and I think actually the very hardest thing to do as a choreographer is to actually make the dance because, you know, it is, it is really hard. Like, what do you base it on? Where do, you know, how do you figure out what that move, movement vocabulary is? Making dance phrases is really, really, really hard. I mean, it's much easier to have a, a subject and sort of illustrate it, but actually, and I think that's why good choreography is so rare. It's, it's just a very difficult. It was hard for him too. People always thought, oh, he just walked in the room and it, all these things, you know, it poured out of him. It just flowed forth. Well, maybe in the room, but before the room, <laughs> there were some months or sometimes years of studying these musical scores and transposing them and transcribing them. There were some months or sometimes years of studying these musical scores and transposing them and transcribing them. He, he wrote his own, you know, you, you can see them there in his hand, these full scores written out in pencil by him. And he, 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 this is a part, I mean, it's back to your original comment, I think, you know, the, this idea of a code, that there's a code that people feel they can't break. And, and in this case, he, there really was a kind of code that he didn't share with anyone else. The dancers didn't know what process he had gone through they only knew what he was giving them to possibly do, and then they were also feeding things back to him. One of my favorite stories about his choreographing is that he was working with Allegra Kent, and he said to her, um, so try this, you know, and she did a movement, and she did something completely different. <laughs> and he said, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, there was a way in which he really was looking to them to help create this well, movement. Yeah, I, and yet he wasn't just, it wasn't just like a free flow. No, not at all. Of course, people kind of knew the philosophy and the rules. And, and he had thought a lot about these, what he called yeah. family of steps. Yeah, you know, yeah. the fa the group, what yeah. music, what family of steps is gonna work with this music? What's the color? What's the tone? What's the feel? What's the look? What's the, it's very you know, complicated. You, you mentioned a couple of times in the book, like, Balanchine's like, you know what to do. Just just do it. Just fill in this music. Or, you know, it's like, really? He did that? I mean, it just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely did. Yeah. I mean, you know. Places in choreography that were, he cared a lot about, like, it had to be really this and only this, especially musically. You know, this is what it needs to be. But how you get there and get, get in and get out, a lot more freedom, a lot more, you know, and then so some of those moments were just kind of, okay, we need some steps here. Do whatever you want, right? Yeah, but he'd already put in motion what the, the right vocabulary would be. I mean, obviously, it wasn't just a free-for-all. And they were a company, yeah. right? And you know what that is. No, you, you create, create company, you, you know? You create a culture together, and that has a, a, a philos, you know, a conceptual frame that's philosophical, and, is, you know, it has a world of steps and, and, and way of thinking. I mean, you create a way of thinking together and you, you know, you, you don't, it's true. You can give the dancers an enormous amount of, um, you know, and dancers are very generous and, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing because you're exhausted, you know, everything intimately about each other, but dancers behave really well and very generously, I think at all times. And you can trust them to be in, you know, they are in extremely intelligent. You can trust them to do the right thing, morally and physically. I think one more question, and then we'll have some time to sign the book and um, we'll talk to Jennifer. Jen, you have a question? Sorry, I'll yeah, do it. <laughs> so, that, the same thing that I was admiring you saw your symposium on the person that has writing. And there's this one moment where it was like at the beginning where he's raising money for the company. There's like all this manic kind of brainstorming. And there's this idea that really struck me as peculiar, um, where they were like, oh, we're gonna have to get fully black, and half of them will be white. You know that? And there's this notion of being like an American sort of mm. reflected and who can they create. Do you think that plays out into the you mean, does it happen? Well, obviously, it doesn't happen. Like, like that's the whole. Like, what happens to that? What happens to that? I mean, that gets. Um, 
I think he, look, he was very interested in black culture and he was very interested in, in jazz and in all kinds of, of dance that was coming out of the, the American, I mean, what would you say? The sort of the, the landscape of, of black America. And he, he, he studied it, he went to it, he, he begged, borrowed, stole from it. You know, he incorporated a lot of ideas. Um, Didn't he kind his... of study syncopation with Catherine Dunham? I mean, yeah, he you know, he Catherine really worked Dunham. with her in order to understand the kind of accent and that was Absolutely. part of... Absolutely. He was yeah. fascinated by her and by her movement. And I mean, he put together a musical that they would do together and they worked with her and her dancers. And instead of giving them steps, apparently, from the records that we do have, he, he would just say, do, do, you know, like this, right? Do what do whatever you think is right. And and then he would kind of try to put it together in a way that that made sense. But he was deeply interested in in these parts of, of American art and and life. And so, but did he did he bring uh, did he create a multiracial company? No. He didn't, and he had some, like you can count them on one hand, over the the course of his um, of the New York City Ballet and the, that he was directing, you know, and most notably Mr. Mitchell. Um, but he wasn't. I I don't think he was. I think he was interested in race not as a social category, but as an aesthetic one. And that that sounds like it might be a I'm avoiding the question in a way. Um, but I think he was so hyper focused on his art, and he—I mean, in the '70s, he got attacked at one point for being, um, you know, for not having more black dancers in his company. And um, he was very defensive because he had helped Arthur Mitchell start the Dance Theater of Harlem, and he said, "You know, I'm doing something. What are you doing?" And how come, how, come, how come you, Clive Barnes, are writing all those articles instead of a black critic? What, what are you doing? And so he, he, he became quite angry. And, you know, but he did have views that were very, you know, he believed that, well, he was kind of, his assistant said to me, you know, he was, he was like a typecast person. You know, he wanted somebody, he had other dancers of color in his company, but most of them did roles that, were stereotypical of you know that you're going to be you're going to play death you're going to play um, you're going to do coffee in the in the Nutcracker or the Arabian whatever version we're calling it right so there were ways in which you know Arthur Mitchell was was going to be puck wearing very few clothes in in Midsummer Night's Dream so there were all of these things that were go so it's it's not a straightforward picture. But I think he also, you know, he put Arthur Mitchell and Diana Adams in Agon in 1957 in a pas de deux together on the stage of the of the uh, city center theater at a time when this was, you know, we're in the middle of the, of the hardest years of the civil rights movement. So he he was like, you got to, somebody said, and when he, Arthur Mitchell joined the company, there were people in the, called the school and said, I, I can't have my daughter in the school when you've got a black man in the company. And he said, well, your daughter, maybe you should take your daughter out then. So he, he stood by his, his dancers. But what and, wasn't, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No. Well, I mean, as I understood the question, wasn't there this notion on the way to America that Balanchine said to Lincoln Kirsten, you know, I want to have eight white dancers and eight black dancers. That is the company I want. That is what would be interesting to me as an American ballet company. And then have I made this up? But then didn't that get smashed because people with the money, the power and the money were like, no, 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 no. This can't happen this way. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I, I, I that I, I idea that certainly <laughs> <laughs> that I well, and, but maybe not. You know, I mean, these ideas, it, it may have just that idea fell away, right? It fell away with the. I mean, originally he was going to be in Hartford, and that fell away very quickly too. And there were lots of things that fell away, and um, so yeah. Interesting, I think, because ballet can be 
classical ballet can be such a, a historical form, whether you go to uh, Giselle, Giselle or to Ruth von Lieben, you're in the 19th century sort of escapist fantasy, or you go to Balanchine and you're, you, you know, you leave history, social issues at the door, and you're like in this sort of form, formal world. It's so interesting, and that's what you do in Apple's Angels, and that's what you do here, to, to see how history actually did make its way into his ballet. And, and you know, the history of theatrical dancing, and it, it does describe the historical conditions that make their way very specifically on the stage, but in a purely sort of metaphoric form, but they represent the ideas that are how that culture, a wonderful, I mean, these books, these two, these two books are such a wonderful contribution to, to dance. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>